Let's make it step by step because this is very important to understand then why we have this broadband and narrowband differentiation. So. <clears throat> So we have our device on the desk. Is a high side switch. Operating at 100 hertz with, let's make a duty cycle of 50%. duty cycle. So this means if we are drawing now our high side switch um, as I said it's an N channel device. So we have the gates, the drain and the sewers here. So the drain is connected to the high terminal of our, the high potential of our battery. So here we have plus 13.5 volt, for example. And here we have connected somewhere our load. Whatever the load is, front light or whatever. Okay. So somewhere here we have a control module, microcontroller, whatever, which is driving this 100 hertz signal. And then the switch is opening and closing with 100 hertz. And it's clear. So then, if you're probing the current here, so how would the current look like? In the ideal situation, it will turn on and turn off at 100 hertz. In reality, we have parasitic elements. There are inductances coming from the loop areas of our cable harness. Also, we have inductances inside of the chip. I told you something about the parasitic inductance of the bond wires. So in reality, the current profile would rather look like this, but that's not super important. Okay, so this is our main switching activity and our main contribution to the electromagnetic emission. And as we said, there is a second source which is related to the charge pump. So the charge pump here somehow drives the gate to a potential that is higher than 13.5 volt. This is what we have discussed last time in order to turn this switch on. And the charge pump is also operated by a periodic clock signal but in this case, it's, let's make it 2.5 megahertz. And what we have measured was the conducted electromagnetic emission of our high side switch at the battery supply pin. So here in this case, we can connect our 150 ohm measuring network, which consists of two resistors and one capacitor. So a 6.8 nanofarad capacitor, a 100 120 ohm resistor, and here is also a 51 ohm resistor to match the input impedance of our EMI receiver. So here usually we have a coaxial cable. That leads to our input, a 50 ohm input. of our EMI receiver. So that's basically the setup. 
of course, we need some decoupling in the direction of the battery because we want to measure the switching activity and the noise that is produced by the IC that goes into the power line and it should not be diverted directly by the battery to ground, so therefore there is usually from here to here also a decoupling element which is a high impedance element so that the noise signal that is produced here goes really into this 150 ohm coupling network. Okay, but that's the basic configuration. So now coming to the broadband and narrowband emission. Uh, I think you agree if we are transferring this signal from the time domain into the frequency domain, this signal looks more or less like this. So now we are transferring it here from the time domain into the frequency domain. So here is our amplitude. What we will see is yeah, noise that is coming from the 100 hertz. Main frequency and then all the harmonics. 200, 300, 400, 500 and so on. I think it's clear. Same for this here, but let's make this purple. But this here starts at 2.5 megahertz, so the first harmonic will probably be somewhere here. Let's make this 2.5 megahertz. Let's move the x-axis a little bit wider here, in this direction. And then the next peak that we will see will most probably be here at 5 megahertz. Then somewhere here at 7.5 and so on up to the very high frequency range. So we have a combination of switching activity separated by 100 hertz and switching activity that is separated by 2.5 megahertz. And the EMI receiver sees everything more or less at the same time depending on at which frequency position we are currently measuring. Okay, so let's start with talking about what does the EMI receiver do. Usually we are typing in here a start frequency and a stop frequency. And then there are all the frequency ranges defined in the CISPR 16 standard where we're defining the resolution bandwidth and everything. And then the EMI receiver starts measuring from the start frequency up to the stop frequency in the same way as an Spectrumalizer, more or less. So, what does the EMI receiver do? Starts at the starting frequency and waits for a certain amount of time and measures everything with his input resolution bandwidth that is there at this time frame at the input. We also talked about how long should the EMI receiver remain at this frequency position. This is the so-called dwell time. And remember, should be at least three times the operation cycle of our IC. Okay, what's the operation cycle of our IC? Actually, it's defined by the lowest frequency that we have in our IC, the 100 hertz switching frequency. So 100 hertz means uh, period uh, a switching time from one period to the other of 10 milliseconds, right? So we have to remain at each frequency position at least 30 milliseconds to make the correct settings. Okay, so we are starting somewhere, yeah, usually at 150 kilohertz, so maybe 150 kilohertz is, let's say, somewhere here. This is our starting frequency. So what does the EMI receiver do? It remains It remains at this frequency position for 300 milliseconds with its resolution bandwidth. 
Now coming to the question, how many spectral components are within the nine kilohertz resolution bandwidth? So we have this kind of Gaussian shaped resolution bandwidth and from here to here we have nine kilohertz. And all the spectral components here are separated by 100 hertz. So how many spectral components are then roughly within the nine kilohertz? So 9,000 divided by 100 is roughly 90, exactly. So at this frequency position, at our starting frequency, within this time frame of 30 milliseconds, I have 90 spectral components that are measured. And usually the spectral components, they are there and they are staying there and they are stable because we are operating the IC at the fixed frequency. We're not changing it or doing anything. Okay, so what the EMI receiver does, it is measuring for 30 milliseconds everything that is there within this nine kilohertz. This is noise and this is also the harmonics of the switching frequency. Question. Um, is it always true that there are all harmonics present, like even and odd, or is it common that usually just one of the two? Is yeah, very good. Um, Thank you very much. Um, I mentioned that we have here a 50% duty cycle. So coming to the theory, if we are really transferring this very, very beautiful looking time domain signal, rectangular signal with 50% duty cycle from the time domain into the frequency domain, then you're absolutely right. We only have the, now I have to think what is even, what is odd. Uh, only have the ungeraden. The odd, yeah. Ungerade is odd? odd. Okay, then thank you. We only have the odd harmonics in our frequency spectrum. And all the even ones have disappeared only if the duty cycle is exactly 50%. Okay. But what's the case in reality? <laughs> our microcontroller is setting, yeah, 50% duty cycle. But as I said, the switching signal does not look like this. It really looks like, if you're zooming in here, we see some yeah, shaped signal. The rise time is not exactly the same as the fall time. And I'm pretty sure that also the duty cycle by itself, not just due to the rise and fall time, will not be exactly 50%. So in reality, we will never ever really come up with exactly 50%. So therefore, we see the even and the odd harmonics. Okay, so, yeah, but really good. So, depends on what we see, or if it's 50% or not, we have 90 or 45 or something, but let's assume we have 90. Okay, now, in, now coming to the definition of broadband. So, if there are roughly more than four spectral components of this switching frequency within the resolution bandwidth, then we usually think of or to talk about broadband emission. Okay, but now we have to talk a little bit more about what is happening now inside of the EMI receiver and what will be then the final result that is displayed on the screen of the EMI receiver. There we need to talk about the internal detectors that we can choose in order to rate our signal. Have you ever heard about detectors inside of the EMI receiver? No? Okay, then let's go a little bit more in detail. What are detectors? This also comes from the old-fashioned radio frequency interference topics, where they have defined our, yeah, in this case, detectors to rate how big is the noise or how important is the interference. And there are different kinds of detectors. The easiest one is the so-called peak detector. And as the name says, it's characterizing the peak emission that is present at a certain amount of time over this frequency range within this resolution bandwidth. So the very simple representation of a peak detector is we have somehow a diode 
And next to the diode is a capacitor. So this is how the very simple representation of a peak detector looks like. This is inside then of the EMI receiver, not next to the input filter. It's, we are mixing this input signal down or maybe up and then we're down again. And then there's a, uh, what is it called in English, Hüllkurven detector? Uh, envelope. Envelope. Yeah, maybe envelope detector, yeah. I have to look it up. So there is internal a kind of detection mechanism and the output signal of this envelope detector will then be rated again by, for example, the peak detector. So what the peak detector does, if I have some, and the internal signal then very often looks like this, uh, it gives out then the maximum, somehow this value here. No matter how long this noise signal was present within this 30 milliseconds. Okay? So the next detector that is important is the average detector. Okay, average, uh, that's clear. What does the average detector do? So the very simple representation is that we additionally have a resistor next to the capacitor. That's correct, hopefully, yeah. And then it's not just the maximum value that is stored. There is an RC time constant, which is then finally giving up out the more or less average function of this detector. Okay, and then the third important detector is the so-called quasi-peak detector. In addition to the peak detector, and the average de detector, this quasi-peak detector has an additional resistor, in this case here, before the capacitor, to also rate how long it takes until this capacitor is charged, and then how long it takes until this capacitor is discharged again. Okay, so what can be the purpose of this quasi-peak detector? Think of the radio reception. So you are listening to a radio station and now you have different kinds of interferences. So as a human person, you will be more interfered or the hearing will be more interfered if you have a continuous uh, disturbance signal. Like you're listening to music and then in the background you hear bzzz. But if the noise signal is just there for a very short amount of time, you might hear only music and click and then music. So maybe this type of noise is not that annoying or critical. But how can the EMI receiver distinguish between if it's a continuous noise bzzz, all over the time, all over the 30 seconds, 30 milliseconds, or if it's just a small noise peak with the same amplitude but not present at the whole time frame, but just a very short click, short amount of time. And this can be done by the quasi-peak detector. So the quasi-peak detector also reads how long was this noise present while we are measuring. Usually the time constants of this quasi-peak detector are also defined in the standard. And very often, I think in this small, uh, Lower frequency range, I think it's one second. So we have to then uh, provide a longer measurement time. Okay, so coming back to the distinguishation between the peak detector and the average detector. So if you're using the peak detector, the reading, if we have a very small noise peak at a very small amount of time, will be the maximum value no matter how long this noise was present. So the output at, that we can see on the display is a peak value. But if we would measure the same noise signal with the quasi-peak detector, then the output would be definitely lower because the quasi-peak also rates how long was this noise present. <laughs> 
Okay, so peak, average, and quasi peak detector. So these are the three, I think, most important detectors. Okay, so depending on what kind of detectors we have, we get different readings. And now also here comes the differentiation between narrowband and broadband. So if we are talking about broadband emissions, then there is a difference between the peak reading, the average detector reading, and the quasi-peak detector reading. The peak detector reading on the EMI receiver is always the highest reading. Then we have the quasi-peak detector reading, and then we have the average detector reading. Don't worry, we will see that in the lab, that we can make different experiments, and you will get then a better feeling on how this our emissions on the display then finally look like. Okay, this was broadband emission. Now let's talk about narrowband emission. So let's suppose we are now moving step by step our resolution bandwidth over the whole frequency range. And this is exactly what the EMI receiver does. It starts at one starting frequency and then it shifts the frequency step towards the stop frequency, and how far it's shifted is also defined. It's usually half the resolution bandwidth. So here, the resolution bandwidth is 9 kilohertz, so then we are shifting by 4.5 kilohertz, and the next frequency position where we are measuring is 154.5 mega uh, kilohertz. And here we are remaining again with our resolution bandwidth. It looks like this for 30 milliseconds. And again, we are rating how many spectral components are there, depending on if you're using the peak average and quasi-peak detector. And so on and so on. But it could also happen that we are now approaching this frequency range here at 2.5 megahertz. And here happens something very special. So we have our EMI receiver now measuring here. We still have the harmonics of the 100 hertz. Well, very, uh, it could be very small. Over here, but they are still present. But in addition, we have the big noise contribution from our fundamental switching frequency of the charge pump. Now, what does the EMI receiver? It, at the peak detector value, or the peak, peak detector reading, it's more or less accumulating all the 100 hertz spectral components plus the peak contribution of the charge pump. And this is then the reading that will be seen on the display. It's more or less the sum of all the spectral components. And as there is a big spectral component from the charge pump, we see then out of our broadband emission, a small narrowband peak that is rising out at our emission diagram. Okay, so narrowband emission is usually an, an emission that is present if only one spectral component is within this resolution bandwidth. In our case, a little bit more complicated because we have two noise sources. We have a broadband contribution from the 100 hertz switching frequency and a narrowband contribution one from the 2.5 megahertz switching. So we are measuring broadband and narrowband at the same time. Okay, and then we are shifting further, so maybe the next frequency step, then we are here, and then we only have the broadband emissions from the 100 hertz until we reach again this frequency range here where we have then the combination of broadband and one narrowband emission. Just in case if we would only have the narrowband emission, so we are just operating this high side switch in the on mode, so then we just have the contribution of the charge pump, we would end up with only one real spectrum component within our resolution bandwidth. I think it's clear. And here comes the interesting thing. If there is only one spectrum component in the resolution bandwidth, the peak, the average, and the quasi-peak detector will give exactly the same reading. And the reading is related to the RMS value of the input signal. So uh, it gets a little bit confusing. Uh, from the fundamental lectures, if we have a 
sinusoidal signal, the peak reading of the sinusoidal signal is the maximum amplitude, okay, clear. The average reading is more or less the average of this uh, signal. Okay, the quasi-peak reading might also read somehow how long this signal is present. But the problem is here that an EMI receiver is designed and designed on purpose so that in the narrow band case, the peak, the average, and the quasi-peak reading give exactly the same value on the display, which is actually rated as the RMS value of the input signal. So don't mix up too much with the fundamental things because the RMS value is definitely not the peak value of a sinusoidal signal and vice versa. But that's the way how an EMI receiver was designed. <laughs> 